Yep. All right, guys. Um, we're starting our second day of training now. Right now, we're currently at the Cal Poly Pomona Student Housing Building. Um, we're in Building A. We called it Building A during construction. Um, there's going to be numbers um, to when the job gets turned over, but we called this Building A. All the drawings will be called Building A. Um, we're in the mechanical room on the first floor. We're going to be talking about our condensing airco boilers. This is what makes the heating hot water. And then uh, through a heat exchanger makes domestic hot water. We have our factory started guy, Sean, with air treatment here. He's going to be giving you guys the training on the boilers themselves. Here's Sean. I'm Sean with Air Treatment Corporation. We're in the rent for Airco. Uh, we have four Benchmark 2000s here, which are low NOx condensing boilers. Um, currently, they are set up in a BST configuration, which is boiler sequencing technology. We have, uh, they have isolation valves on each inlet piping. Uh, so we are staging them to meet our demand. Um, currently we have only one of them running, but as that demand increases, as if we get up to 50%, it's gonna call on another one, and then they're gonna try and back down. So we keep the lowest fire rate, and we stay as efficient as possible. When it kicks on that other one, it's gonna open up one of the isolation valves, and, um, and then we will only have those two running. It will always keep one open, no matter what. If they're all shut off, they'll all stay open, and uh, the pump should um, accommodate accordingly based on the, the controls contractors PID setup. So, um, these are in a, a Modbus header temperature sensor configuration so that they have an auto master, is what they call it. So we don't have just one designated master where there's hard wires coming to a master boiler. Uh, they're all coming in through communication, which is just a daisy chain loop, which goes to back to that control panel, which has a proto node, and then also has the Modbus header temperature sensor configuration in there. So if a car were to drive through here and knock out one of these boilers, it would just switch to another master. And, and we can stay running. They will they will shift based on run hours. Whichever one has the least amount of run hours will be the, the next one to fire up, so that they get even wear and tear on them. Um, right here we see that this one's currently the manager V1, and you'll notice on there that you see remote signal fault which means maybe someone turned off power somewhere or something like that, maybe with the construction stuff. It got turned off, it didn't see that, and came back. But we don't see an active fault light here. You know, so it's just letting us know that something happened there. But it's all back up and running, and it's all okay. You could just hit clear, and that goes away. So that's nothing to be concerned about. It just shows you that something happened there. Um, this is your display menu. Um, if you hit the menu button, if you keep hitting the menu button, you're going to go around all the different menus. And then you hit the up and down, you're going to go up and down through those different selections in that menu. So if right now we're in the display menu, I can go down and I see run hours, run cycles, uh, all my information that I would need about what's going on right now. Exhaust temperature, valve position, air temperature. And I can see the fault log. I press change and I can go through the fault log and I can see what's happened. Um, so going this way, going around the menu, I can hit, keep hitting menu. I see setup menu. Um, tuning menu, BST menu, configuration menu. Most of this stuff you won't need. Um, if you need anything, and here, here's the, I'll give you the, I'll give you the, um, the password for this. Okay, so it's going to be 159, so you'll just hit, oh boy. So change, one, change, five, nine, enter, so it's password number one. 
and then you can go through and you can change, you know, set point or whatever. Um, changing that set point will only do the local set point. We are resetting the temperature through controls, okay? So like the header temperature sensor will be uh, will be reset through VMS. That's correct. So That's correct. So, so if something happens to, to the VMS, then the, we have the possibility of we might be able to manually set it here. To yeah, and I'll show you where that is. I'll show you where that the is. Automatically so you switch over to their internal set point. Right. So it'll show, let's see. There should be one here that says active set point. Which is what they're writing to it. And, so, yeah, right. let me clarify too that when I said they're resetting, they're not going to be resetting the lower the temperature. We have to stay at 150 all the time because right. we're making domestic hot water at 140 with these boilers, okay? So the only thing they're doing with that in, that reset feature would be to disable the whole system. If they drop the temperature way down, it'll turn off the system. So if you see like a super low set point, it's because the system, they don't, that's how they're enabling and disabling the system. Okay, does that make sense? So if that, if we lose that, if uh, we lose communication, we lose all that, we have also this internal set point here right now, which is 146. So if you, you would see like a, that like remote signal loss, you've probably seen active fault, communication fault, and then you might see it running in standalone mode, which would be 146. Can you put that to 150? Yeah. Right. So we we'll just change that to 150. It won't let you do that until you have the password in there. So. Um, okay, so we can take a look at what we got going on here. These right out like that. Um, so gas coming in, we have our main regulator and then we have these step down regulators which are flow through regulators which are provided by airco uh, so these need to be set uh, while we're actually getting gas through it so we have gas coming in uh you know we're about i don't know seven and a half eight pounds pressure coming in safety shut off valve. If for any, any reason we have a power loss or fault or anything like that, that's gonna, that plunger's gonna drop down and we're gonna shut off any gas to the system. Um, so we're stepping down, this is our manifold pressure. It's, you know, about three and a half pounds on something like this. Gas coming in, and then we have our air fuel mixing valve. It's kinda like the throttle body on a car, this is actually this guy used to like to fix up hot rods and stuff like that. We got, he's got a K&N air filter on it. It's a factory. Yep. So cleaning that is just like any K&N air filter. You got the oil and the yeah. washer and stuff like that. So, um, okay, so probably going in and then you have an ECM motor blowing down and you got a low knock sock right there, which kind of looks like, you know, like a kerosene lantern. You got that glow. So we're blowing down, going through the heat exchanger, and then coming back up, and then out through here. So you got all the all the condensates going down to the bottom. You got um, in the back. You have um, you have your trap, and you have condensate rocks, condensate neutralizer. Did we we did condensate neutralizer in this one, yeah. Yep. Okay, so those rocks need to be checked. Uh, pretty regularly, it's pretty common for those to get you know backed up and, and, and bumped up and stuff like that. And the fault you'll see with that is actually going to be an airflow fault because when we start backing up water in there, it's not going to be able to blow through there. So, uh, so you're, it's going to be backed up with water, and you'll see airflow fault. These the pressure sensors will see that. How do you clean that up? Um, you take out the rocks and wash them out, and you can you can take a pH reading, see if they're still good, or we recommend replacing those once a year, anyways. So, so on the back of the boiler, when he said the, the fluid piping that comes up, there's a float assembly. If you guys walk around the boiler, we can look at it. There's a sight glass actually in the top of the float can. If you see that ball stuck at the top, that means it's not draining. Okay, yeah. so you can do a visual and you can catch it before it would trip the boiler out. I'd say that'd be like, if you're making a round daily through here, do it daily, uh, like you know weekly. Just make sure you're doing an inspection on that. You could easily see it. You might just need a flashlight, sign, sign the flashlight in there. You see the ball floating and it's not at the bottom. Obviously, the unit has to be running. That means it's kind of stay backed up into that. It's not draining out of um, out of the system. 
I do believe we're going into condensate pumps first though. Yeah. Yeah, we're draining into condensate pumps and then pumping into the into the pH tanks, okay? The neutralizer tanks. We can see that down here on the ground. So we're pumping into it and then it drains out gravity. So you probably would see the pump. You probably see it, it would overflow probably um, maybe out the side of the tank or something. But if you see it overflowing in front of the pump, then either we lost power to the pump, one of the outlets is tripped. Um, so that'll be something that's super important that you guys are um, doing your daily rounds on these. It's just the uh, the tanks were higher than all the, the floors, so they had to go into the pumps first. The pumps are rated for the condensate. Um, if you do have to replace the pump eventually, just make sure you replace it with the same exact or equal. Just make sure it's rated for pH, okay? Because the, the water coming out of these boilers is acidic, okay? And as far as safeties, we got uh, three different high limit safeties. The first one is going to be in the Seymour controller itself, uh, which if it sees that high limit, say that valve doesn't open up and then we just start cooking water, it's going to see that high limit and it's just going to shut itself down. And that one's on auto reset when that, one, when that water starts to cool down again, it'll try again. Um, next we have our hard limits, we have a digital one, and we have uh, just old fashioned safety here. So, so you got three different safeties to prevent uh, any high temperature, high water temperature safeties. You also have low water cutout, and these may have, yeah, we have a secondary low water cutout as well. So they have a reset switch on their secondary low water cutout. Uh, right on the back side, coming out, yeah. you'll see there's a little rocker switch that's a reset. Yeah. Uh, um, and then we have shutoffs on the wall over there for, for disconnects to shut off water to the uh, boilers and the service cell. We are using boost transformers. Um, they're going from, I think it was like 208 to 480. Let me look and double check. It went the other way. We're knocking the power down. I think it took, yeah, it took the higher voltage and knocked it down to 120 volts. Okay. The higher so, voltage being 280 right there. Or? I, I mean, uh, 208. Yeah, 208. Or no? It's got to be 208. We can verify that with the like. I'll double check with that real quick, okay? I'll get back to you. I can't remember which way we went with it. Um, so maintenance, there's there's two different maintenance options uh, when you contact Airco to get uh, your maintenance kits. There's the uh, 12 month maintenance kit, which includes uh, flame sensors, um, spark igniter, uh, that sort of thing. So that's, that's your annual inspection. Um, the second year, they have a 24 month maintenance kit, which is, includes the gaskets to pull off the blower and inspect that sock, and just a little bit more thorough stuff. Um, so every two years, they recommend doing that. So then after that, you can go back to the one year maintenance kit. Um, what about as far as quick bounds? What is it? Any real quick bounds to shut the gas off? Outside. Yeah. What was that question? Earthquake valves. You missed it yesterday. Okay, yeah, we talked about the earthquake valve yesterday. Um, there's an earthquake valve out when we were walking up on the right side. It's pretty much right behind this wall right here. So if you walk to the other side, you walk to the wall. And then also, it is a 480 volt. It's 480 volt stepping down to 120. Okay. That's a 4M1. Double check with the electrician, but I think the 4M is a 480 mechanical panel. Okay. Just double check with them though. Okay. Um, I think that's it. Any, any questions? No. Okay. Yeah, I wonder what kind of ignition that was for Jerry said it was spark ignitions. Uh, do you guys do servicing of boilers, yeah. or do you do just startup? Oh, that's true. Okay. Yeah. So for like your annual inspections and stuff like that, and the calibrations, if you don't have um, 
the combustion annualizers and stuff like that, Air Treatment is a good company that would um, yeah. be able to help you guys out with your annuals. We usually use SART from McDonald's. Whoever you use, just make sure they're a certified uh, company to work on it. Okay. Move over to the view changes. You guys have any questions on the benchmarks? You guys understand the staging? What the flashing? What does the flashing light mean? It's the current master, yeah. yeah. And that's any of them can flash. Right? Yeah. That's so that's reading the temperature at the header. You see that? that because that's the temperature. Yeah. From, these are these are the local temperatures. This is the header temperature. The one that's flashing. And we talked. I believe yesterday I mentioned where the header temperature was, but it's up against. It's up in the piping above this duct worker up here. It has to be in a certain amount of straight runs of pipe, and that's where it would fit. Okay. So the the header sensor is up on top of the heating hot water piping. It's up on top of the duct. Is the password the same for them all? For the what? <coughs> the password. Is it the same for all of them? The yeah. Pins? Okay. Yeah. That's the standard. That's an Erico standard. Oh, Erico standard. Or just the user, yeah, the user entry Average level standard. password. Okay. Where you can't make... Any changes. Well, you can make some basic level Limited changes. Right, it right, won't, right. like, affect how the unit right. runs okay. itself. So how different are these going to run with the control system? Because the control system is not up and running yet. None at all. Because the, the boilers themselves are sequencing themselves. All Sunbelt is doing out here is telling the system to turn on. You turn on and run yourself. All the modulations of all the valves and everything in here, the staging the boilers is all internal to the, what Sean mentioned, the BST, the boiler sequencing so, technology. So for some reason, the control system's down and won't make a difference to, to the hot water. They'll then work on their internal stuff. Right, they will just switch to the, the internal. Yeah. But then all four will probably be running. You could also have that happen, but then they would start staging themselves down and eventually so one it, would turn off. If all four are running, it does, you know, we don't need to worry about anything. You're wasting energy. No, I understand that, yes. but it's just, it's emergency kind of exactly, thing. Exactly. I mean, if it goes one day, if it goes a week, we're going to pull somebody out. You know? Yeah, I would try to get out sooner than sooner a week. Than, I'm but, just saying, but I mean, it's yeah, just, it's not going to be the end of the world. Nothing. Right. It's still going to work. It, it's still going to work. It's, all the safeties are still there. You're just going to be less efficient. So if all four boilers are running, then they all be flashing. All four of them. No, they'll go in. They'll go into their internal controls, and it'll say. I think it does, it, like when Sean said, it said network failure, because remember this, okay, okay. the communication right now, linking all these together is a Modbus communication link. So if, if that link gets broken somehow and they can't all talk, they will go into a fail-safe mode, okay? So you so, have to look at the display and see what, yeah. the net ocean. Yeah, and in, on some weird power glitches, you might see two units that are flashing. What we need to do is uh, cycle power to all the boilers, so you'll want to come over and switch all the disconnect switches off. And then this panel right here. So this is the Modbus header transmitter, the power supply, and the communication device right here. The right breaker switch right here is the power for this device in the Modbus unit. So when we cycle power to all the boilers, and we're gonna to wanna to cycle power to this. And if we're also getting a communication error, what we can do is cycle power to this protonode is how they're talking. Um, we have to verify with Doug. We went back and forth. I think they're just doing Modbus to Modbus, but there's okay. different types of Modbuses. But we just want to cycle power to this too, so you can um, gently um, pull this this plug down, and then the lights will go out. And then trying a specific order to power stuff back up. We want the proto node first. I like to I like to turn on the boilers first, and then the proto node. Okay. I try and get them like all at the same time. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, obviously, it's going to be kind of impossible with that. So then flip the switches back on on the boilers, flip the switch back on on the Modbus um, transmitter loop, and then give it a sec, let everything try to get in. You might get some errors at first, give it like a minute or so, and it should work itself out, and then you can uh, plug the proto node back in. Try to so, show them how to, show sure. how to do the manual valve. Yeah, uh, sure. And what are, are these the disconnects to the power off for each boiler? Yes, and then these are the transformers right. that are feeding each individual unit. So if you switch off those switches, you kill the power to that? Yes, the okay. inlet power to the units, yeah. Okay. There is another toggle switch, if uh, Sean mentioned, on the front of the units that will yeah. turn off the power, but it's not going to turn off power into the control panel. Right, right. right. That will. So this will turn off all power okay. to each individual boiler. Okay. 
Yeah, that's right. If, if you wanted to shut off one boiler, I recommend using this toggle switch to shut it off because okay. that'll that won't affect the valve operation or any of that kind of stuff. But if you did want to get it to run in a pinch, yeah, and really need to fire, um, you can do. Are you saying that manual mode? Well, the manual, the manual. Fire. I don't think we should. Okay. Because if you leave it that way, it overshoots temperature. Yeah. And there's a really low load. You right. shouldn't because of the domestic, but yeah. I don't okay. think there's any reason you would manually need to have this boiler fire itself. Yeah. It should come up all by itself. Hopefully by the time one gets down then. Yeah, because we have the design intent of this is to only have three running, but that's three at full fire. Just know that with the, the air coast firing sequence, we can actually run four. But remember, we're not running them at full speed. We'll never, we don't ever, air coast sequencing doesn't ever want them to run at 100%. They're super inefficient at that point, okay? So, so here's the question. At our Christmas break, at the holiday, we might only have Four people in the building, and so is it. Will the cert pump keep up with the demand on the eighth floor, or is it going to be a? a now lag? I just want to make sure I'm following the direction you're going. We're on our heating hot water system. We're, you're still talking about heating hot water, right? Yeah. Not domestic. Heating hot water. Okay. Yeah. So the circulation pumps over here, the two that we talked about yesterday, heating hot water pump one and two, they can still circulate water um, even for those four. And if we get down to a certain number of GPM. Um, I think in this building I forgot to point it out, so I'll point out that heating hot water bypass loop that I showed you in building oh, yeah, B. In so it let's uh, let's peek at that tube. real quick because yeah. it does have to do with the boiler. That's gonna be this line right here. Okay, this pipe right here, my laser pointer on. Okay. There's a control valve right above this bulge in the insulation. So if the GP gets to, um, if we're not flowing enough water, that valve will start opening for minimum flow for the boilers. Okay. We'll, so we'll have minimum flow over the boilers, but also still be able to pump water out to the building. Okay. okay. We have a different way of dealing with that too on the heat exchangers when we get over there. We'll talk okay. about, there's a three-way valve over there. Okay. When we get over there, I'll talk about that. Okay. Um, so let me get back. Can't remember what I was talking about over here. Don't go in manual. We'll yeah. Don't go in manual. I, I can't see why we need manual mode. There's a redundant boiler in the design. But just know if there was a big enough load, you can see all four running, but they'll be at a low firing rate, okay? So it's not gonna be abstract. Um, and then the gas reg will be able to handle that situation. But we would never wanna see all four running at 100%. Something's wrong, we gotta start investigating, okay? Really, you shouldn't see any one of them at 100%, okay? So when you say running at 100% on the display, it will say 100%. Yep, okay. you'll see those uh, LEDs the up LEDs, at the 100% okay, line. Okay, 100%. Okay. So if, if any of them are running at 100, then we've got a quick way to get started. Start looking into, hey, why are we at 100? Why aren't we cycling on another boiler? Now here's the deal, if you go over there and turn off all three of the switches on the other three but, boilers, you <laughs> might see one at 100%, but then if you start flipping those switches back on, obviously if there's not a problem with the unit, right, then it should start I mean, there's a there's a pin loop and all that that's gonna have to time through and understand that that's in the loop now. But so if you flip the switch, it won't just turn on automatically. Okay, Does that makes sense. But as of now, I can't see why you would want to fire that unit in manual mode because if you do, it'll always be running. It doesn't cycle on and off, right? Unless no. you turn it back off. Right. So potentially we could overshoot and over temperature stuff. Right. There's safeties, but again, at this point can't see why you'd want to do that. There should be enough boilers in the system that we shouldn't need to fire one in manual mode. I mean, I guess unless somehow auto didn't work, at that point I would still recommend, I would call someone in right, at that point, right? right? right. It's, just, it's just, yeah, I think manual mode is, can create problems, okay? Cool, uh, we're gonna roll over into the heat exchangers over here. We'll talk about these two, and then we'll quickly walk over to B. It's the same stuff. Did you see you put your eyes on that over there? A little bit of different configuration. And then um, we'll probably go into VFD stuff. Okay? There's not a whole lot to these smart plates. Um, it's basically just a heat exchanger. So you got uh, heating supply, heating return, and so yeah. through. You got a mixing valve there. And you have a, on the domestic water side, you have a circulation pump, and then you've got a set of 
three temperature sensors, which does a calculation of how much, how quickly the water's going through there and how quickly to anticipate the rate of change. And um, they do a pretty good job of, of accommodating for the rapid changes. Um, not much to it. You, on your, this is your main controller here. You've got your set point right here, which is 120. You've got the actual temperature, which is 125. So I'm looking into this unit right now. I was getting some weird alarms, so I dropped the temperature down just to make sure it'll maintain there. Uh, the, the set points on these units are always going to be 140, okay? We want both set at 140 at all times. The highest demands of the building will require both heat exchangers to be on at the same time, okay? It then goes to the mixing valve over here, and then up. Well, the, the heat exchanger is only putting water into the tanks. Oh, into the tanks. Then from the okay. tanks it goes through. From the here. tanks, then it goes so to the mixing 140, valve. So it's 140, 140, and then it goes 120 over 120 there. leaving to the to and the, all the fixtures. Just just for uh, just a dumb question. No on the thing. eighth floor, on the eighth floor, when you open up the hot water yeah. faucet in the sink and you put a thermometer in there, you should yeah. read 120. It'll probably be like. We're gonna have some thermal. No, 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 no. I'm about it. It. So what? Yeah. So I've seen around five degrees or so. Okay. Yeah. So if it's a hundred, if we get a hundred on the eighth floor, then we've got a problem. There's a problem. Somewhere. Okay. We're definitely so, not circulating. So water. if we get a hundred and hundred twenty, hundred and ten, hundred and twelve, we okay. Yeah, I, yeah. I would say in the yeah. summer it'll be different as opposed to in the no. middle of winter. It should be the yeah. same. Should, oh, all okay. the time. It okay. should be always put out. No matter what the demand is. From here, yeah, because of our research loop. We can talk about that when Sean's done. I'll review all that because I know there's a lot of information yesterday, and we're still we have tanks and pumps today, so no, we're, uh, we're, we're following along. Yeah. So okay. Cool. Uh, there's uh, yeah. So this is your over temperature alarm. If uh, if that gets set off, you're gonna hear a large, you know, an audible alarm. And there's the reset yeah. there. Um, in input and output temperatures right here. Um, this also has a manual mode, but same thing like that. It's going to cause more problems than, than you know, just you know, leaving it open. And, and, and that's actually um, in a percentage and not temperature, so it's it's really easy to overshoot on a manual mode thing. And so you have um, you know pressure relief valve and all that. Uh, so what maintenance do we generally do on this? Just besides visual inspection. Um, yeah, not a whole lot of maintenance on this. Um, okay. I haven't had to do any personally, but yeah, I, yeah, just probably visual inspection, maybe clean out the cabinet and dust and stuff like that. Uh, maybe check the accuracy of the temperatures. Um, I can't think. Uh, you know, water system treatment. You know, check the strainers and whatever the water guy does. You know, so. On the heating hot wise side, there is a. Um, Kind of like a differential pressure gauge that tells you clean, getting close to dirty and dirty. So we're in the clean now. Just keep an eye on that gauge. It's right down here. Okay. You can see that's on this one too. Each one of them has oh, it. Yeah. And then when it's dirty, what do we clean? So there's a strainer inside okay, this body right here. Okay. Right. So if we start getting into the uh, the change, the yellow area, yeah. what you'll want to do is shut off the outlet valve and shut off the inlet valve. You want to hook up a hose to this drain right here. Run it over to, I mean, the floor, that drain could work, yeah, any of the one. drains. Actually, no, I think there's one behind me too. Yeah. Obviously, you're going to want it, it's going to be a gravity draining system, so you don't want to make a big loop and up because it won't drain all the water out. This is mostly probably just getting the pressure off of the system. So once you have the hose to the drain, you'll open this. There's a little black drain valve down here. You open that one out and take the pressure off. Remember, you're working on the heating hot water side on this one. Yeah. Um, and then down here, there's a nut you would loosen. Um, just make sure all the water's out. Without, um, when you shut this valve and this valve, actually we have valves up higher. I would actually recommend using the higher valves. If you just try to use these two, this the system's kind of airlocked. You don't have a way to, you know, you need air to come in when you're draining the water out. You could break a union. These are pretty big unions, but if you come up here, and shut these two valves. If you take this little quarter inch piece plug out, right, there's right. your vent right there. It's a little easier. That's what I did when I cleaned them. Um, just make sure you put it back in before you turn on the water. So there's double redundant shut off valves, supply and return, supply and return here. Um, so let's do that. We'll just shut these valves right now.
I, I can even get it to move is the problem. So that would be a thing too is uh, yesterday I didn't mention in our valve training, but all these valves, right. at least like every, they say yearly, I would do it more oh, than wow. a year. But if you come in, then. yes, exercise the valves or else they will become stuck, okay? So we shut it off here. We have our hose, right? We hook our hose, we take this cap off, put our hose on, and then this valve right here you would open, drain the pressure off. And it's gonna be okay. hot water, right? It is hot water, it's 150 degrees, so this unit doesn't feel like it's been on for a while. So the, the temperature's not that bad. If it's getting dirty, remember we need in high flow, high demand times, if this was dirty, we do need both on at all times. If you're doing your quick maintenance, quick strainer cleaning. Uh, both, both what, both heat exchangers? Yeah, both heat exchangers yeah. need to be on at the same time, yeah. But that'd be like in the middle of the day, or like maybe mid, early morning, early mid morning when everyone's waking up, taking showers or at night. Obviously that's probably not gonna be the time. Just leave that strainer in the yellow. Hopefully it's not in the red at that point, you know? Well, we have our, we have our holiday break in December. There you so go, the so that's like the best time. The building, yeah. We're going to the summer before people move in. But know. if it happens when people are here, if just, you, I mean, be quick. Yeah, and make sure that when anytime you take a strainer apart, it's always good to make sure you have an extra gasket on hand, okay? I can't remember right now if this is an o ring, like a rubber o ring or a gasket material, but if you Google the, um, if you look up the part number, it'll give you replacement kits. So anytime you take something like that apart, make sure you have like a rebuild kit with you. Hopefully, you don't need to use it. But then if you do rip a gasket, you're like, oh my God, I ripped this gasket and I can't put it together and we need it, okay? So always, anytime you're disassembling something, make sure you're looking at the O&M and finding those repair part kits and ordering those and have them on hand before you start your, your work, okay? Um, so it's off here, we drain the pressure out. Once this thing tries, and then we go up and we take our peach plug out. That's what this is called right here. It's used for measuring differential pressure across this. Um, you'll take this out, it'll drain all the water out, and then at that point you can loosen this nut, drop the strainer screen out, clean it out, um, inspect your gasket, put the screen back in, make sure the gasket's on and seated, and then um, I always try to put the screen in. There's like a little a ring. I try to put the screen in, and I always try to kind of tilt the screen up, because as it's going in, it's going to want to try to fall down, and then it'll fit up inside the, the strainer body here, and then just tighten it in. If you feel resistance while you're tightening it back in, stop, pull it back out, make sure you're not dent bending the screen, okay? It can't happen. Uh, don't just keep going. And then after this is back in, you would close the valve. <clears throat> and then what you could do is, uh, you'd wanna put this needle back in. Do you guys have Pete's plug needles? You know what the needle yes. part looks like? Yeah. So put this back in. I use refriger old refrigeration hoses, and then I get um, flare fittings, and I adapt the needle to a flare fitting, and I use that. So then I would put that needle in with that hose into a bucket and then open yeah, the supply valve and then that way you're venting it. Uh, but to do that, the valve, this unit would have to be open. Um, so hopefully it's calling, or uh, excuse me too, uh, before we would start the whole process of cleaning the strainer, we'd wanna make sure we turn off power, okay? Turn off power first. Um, there is no external disconnect switch to these units. This is all we got, okay? There's also a fuse on the side power, here. Power's probably in that. Not that one, that's a high voltage way. 480 panel. Okay. So that's the 480 that feeds all the pumps and the, the transformers yeah, for the boilers. The boilers right. Any 480 volt stuff. Okay. okay. So, so this one would be in the electrical room over? Probably that way right there, yeah. yeah on that the, on the other right side there. of this wall. Yeah. Okay. But uh, for that, you, to, to need to turn off this power, you'd want to be working like inside the control right. room. Right, right, right. yeah. Um, and of course, follow the campus's procedure on working on around or on a live voltage, right? It's 120, so there's different ratings of arc flash protection gear that you would need in certain levels. So maybe you just be able to do that with your gloves and long sleeves or however, whatever the company's procedure is on that. Okay, so we had the power off to that before we started this whole process. Now we're still filling. Um, you'd want to open the supply valve first. That's where it's gonna get tricky right now. There could be a little bit of air. All we're trying to do is do our best job to get the air out of the system. Um, this valve right here is like a bypass three-way valve. This is what I was talking about over when we were looking at the boilers when I showed you the, the actual bypass loop that Sunbelt is controlling. 
My opinion, like I said, this hadn't been running in a while and the piping's kind of cooler, right? But if we have, if we left this cracked open just a little bit, we'll always have that hot water flow here. So that way when this unit tries to operate, the hot water will be there instantaneously instead of now it's got to like heat up that whole run of pipe. It's up in the air if you leave this open or leave it closed. The manufacturer doesn't care what you do and our engineer doesn't. It's just my opinion on being in the field and being in the trade, I would recommend having it open that way when this valve starts to start modulating, the hot water's there right away and this unit can see that, okay? Or else it'll see that it's cooling the water, it'll be opening the valve and then that slug of hot water will come in and it could possibly overshoot, right? So, um, yeah, so if you leave this cracked open, that way too when you're venting the air back out, you have a way for the water to push out. Now just know that if the valve's closed, it's not gonna be venting out the heat exchanger, okay? Um, what you could do for that, Sean, right, is... Um, Push it. Yeah, this switch, or this valve has a manual mode. Um, so once you vent it out this like bypass loop, you can close the valve back up. And if you push down and twist this, I'm turning it into manual mode. So I'm physically opening the valve, allowing water to go through the heat exchanger. So then we'd be venting it out again, right? It'd be making your hose vent and shake and all that. You just have to make sure that you guys can see there's an arrow on top of this, that you put it back into the auto position. So we got all the air out, then we spin this thing back over. If you leave it here, it will overshoot the water temperature going into those tanks, okay? So that's another thing. If you see the tanks at too high of a temperature, if they're at 150, you get a constant 150 outlet here, make sure this is in auto. So there's a little, uh, you can see this white gauge is going smaller, 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 and then over here it says auto, okay? So we go auto and it'll pop back up. Now this thing is in auto control, it'll take the control signal. And then if you want to turn it off so it won't open at all, you push it and turn it over to the, what does it say? It says off position right here, okay? So that way this valve won't open or close. That's a way you could check to see if the valve's seating right. When it's moving by itself, does this thing actually move? I don't believe so, does it? I I'm not sure. I thought it did, right? Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure, but you'll definitely be able to see the plunger moving. Yeah, right. Okay, so right now it's in off. We want to make sure when we're done, it's in auto. Oh, no, it pops up. Okay, it's in auto and it's popped up. So that so, way the controller so when it's can... it's in manual it. too, is it just down the whole time it's in manual? If you're in manual, you're opening it up. No, I'm saying like, so you push this down to manual. It's open right now. You're no, flowing. It won't come back up this thing. Uh, no, it's going to stay like that. It'll stay Because it's pushing the plunger down, yeah. And it's going okay. down as it is. So it's really easy to tell auto, because auto's the only one where it'll pop up. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, super important on that one. Okay, we filled it back up. We vented it out here. Uh, once you're done, you'd want to shut that real quick. Shut the, the supply valve so you can take all this. Or, you know, you've already put this back in. You've already redoped it, right? It's already in. You can pull your needle out and you can just keep both valves open and you'll be back in flow, okay? Does that make sense? Yep. So you're saying that should be cracked open all times? That's my personal opinion. Again, in the Airco doesn't have a preference and our engineer didn't. My experience, we can start with the clothes and see what happens if we get the air codes, you know, the alarms if it's constantly overshooting. <laughs> yeah, that's because we have the bypass open right now. So if I close this, it's all gonna go away. Oh, okay. okay. So we don't need a bajillion GPM. So this is an auto flow at 75 GPM, but that's when the heat exchanger is fully open. We don't need more than 75 GPM. And on this bypass loop, we don't want 75 GPM. That's why we want to leave this thing wide open. It's waste energy. But we want just a skosh a bit of, I mean, we, I probably had it cracked open too far. You just, just so you can barely hear it or barely start feeling it. Like something like that. I can barely hear water now. That's all we need, just a little bit of water coming through here. Trickle. So the 150 is here right away. That's what we're trying to accomplish by using this. And by doing this, you'll always have a minimum flow for the boilers too. So you kind of get both, you know? It's up to you guys. If we do start having problems, if like, if somehow we can't keep up with the tanks, um, I was saying that this is an auto flow. Do you guys all understand what that means and how they would work? 
there's like a calculated orifice in here with a spring, and that spring will always give you 75 GPM. There is a certain range though. It's a differential pressure across these two ports. This specific valve, we'd have to look up the information on it to figure out what that range is supposed to be. So most of the time they're like two to 60, two to 35. We have to check out the manual and see what it is. If you have that differential, it's giving you 75 GPM. If not, we need to figure out if the strainer's clean. This is just an idea maker, right? This isn't God's end word, right? Or anybody's end word. So we verify flow here, check the strainer, the strainer's clear, then you would need to shut the unit down like we talked about for the strainer cleaning. And you could do the same thing here, break the union and then start unthreading this device, see if something got stuck. Stuck it closed, stuck it open, okay? And then just to reiterate, the set point on both of these, when we're done, will be 140 on each. We wanna keep them there. Uh, that way the, the highest demand situations, the, the system will be able to keep up with that. And remember, this will be a quick review too. The two pumps up on the wall here, these guys right here, are only pumping water through the heat exchangers back into the tanks, okay? And each pump can run individually. Each pump has an aquastat that's right over here on the side of the tank. There's this one here, and on the back side here, there's gonna be another aquastat, okay? Each one's differently. It should be the left tank, the top pump, right tank, bottom pump. The tank set points are 140. 140. 140, okay? And Make sure that, they stay that, there. That's always gonna be 120. 120. If it's off a little bit, it's a problem. So we so want it to be, yeah, we don't want it to be, I would say more than like two or three degrees below that 120, because as you go up the building, you start cooling off up there, our thermostatic valves can't operate, okay? They can't right. close and push the water to the ends of the building. That's the ones on the eighth floor. The 120 is the domestic hot water to the showers and right. the bathrooms, right. the sinks, right. lab sinks. The valves you're talking about, them, them things you showed us on the eighth floor? Yeah, those yeah, temp 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 temperature trolls. Temperature okay. Who's those? One per bathroom, or one really per any fixture that's up there. The guest bathroom yeah, has bathroom one, right. the janitor closet yeah, has one. Closet. All the restrooms have it down the hallways. Shut off valves in front and behind it. John, anything else you want to add for the heat exchangers? The heat exchangers are, uh, are they, um, is there an air gap between the sheets? Like, can there be dripping out the bottom or how does that work, do you know? Oh, uh, if they're leaking? Um, I haven't even come into it. Okay. Just keep in mind, yeah, keep out for the bottom. <laughs> if you yeah. see leaks, then it's a, uh, could be a gasket or a, or how a plate. How long fit. generally do these last? Any kind of? Um, I am not sure. The, they change the, them very frequently. No, I mean, it, they shouldn't, they're, they're stainless. Solid, yeah. Okay. Are they pulling the plates yearly or bi year, biannually? Are you cleaning plates biannually or? Um, I'd have to check. Okay. I'm so sure. we could refer to the O&M for that yeah. on the plate cleaning. It okay. definitely so shouldn't be more than this. There's a little uh, bit, yeah. The biggest thing too is make sure the shirt pump is still years, running. Then. Yeah, 10 years, yeah, that would be. We'll have to double check the O&M manual though for that duration of cleaning plates. I would think it's at least yearly, if not bi-yearly. And that'll all be de determined too on the heating hot water side if the chemicals are maintained on that too. Another big thing would be to make sure these, the condensate pumps are running, or not, excuse me, not condensate pumps, these circulation pumps down here. Because remember, that's also how the controller is controlling the control valve. So if that pump's not working and it can't detect those um, the flow or the temperature changes, it's not going to be able to control the outlet temperature quite right. Okay. Is that showing an alarm on here? Mm, I don't believe there's not an alarm for that. No. Oh. But that could be one of the things where your temperature will change a little up there, and that could be one of the. the your problems. outlet probably you'll probably see the temperatures here that won't look right. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Then you'll know it's a pump. Yeah. Okay. And you can see that the pump's running. Normally, if you kind of stick your hand on the shell, you feel the like it's a little bit warm. Yeah, it's right. a little bit warm. That pump will always be running. There is no BMS controls enabling disabling the system. The system's always energized, so that pump will always be running. Okay. Okay. There's. And it wants to be, it wants to be constantly. Exactly. It, it needs to be running at any time. This unit's powered. That pump should be running. If it's not, we got a problem. So we need to make sure that we figure out why the pump's not running.
The exchangers, a lot of information. Any other questions on any of the piping that goes in between the two? From the heat exchangers to the tanks? Each pump can run individually. I can't remember if I told you guys or if it was the other guys. If you do have to drain a tank, um, if you... Three valves. Let's see that. We're three valves. Well, three plus, valves. And then the plus the utilizer. Right there. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. So um, part of today's training too is the storage tanks. The only thing I don't think I remembered yesterday was the inspection. So in uh, the o ms there is a maintenance section on that. Um, they want monthly. I wouldn't. I couldn't see why you need to do it more more than monthly here. But they want you to pop the relief valve momentarily. You slowly lift it up, and then slowly drop it back down. Just when you do that, you potentially could get debris on, stuck on the seat, and then the valve would either need to be replaced or the seat needs to be cleaned. Um, check the tank pressure. Unfortunately, right now there's no pressure gauges on the tank. Uh, but we can know that if we check the pressure anywhere in the system before that, as long as there's not a check valve, it's gonna be the same pressure, okay? So, so they aren't, you're not gonna put any pressure gauges on these? There's, yeah, there's none shown on the drawing. So we can ask to pay and have them put on Of course. Them. Okay, where would they go? Uh, there's a couple of little, um, spots they could go. If it was like a combination temperature pressure gauge, there's a one inch port at the top okay. that could be used. Um, there's also a couple other plugs that are on the side of the units. So we got two inch here. Okay, okay. So there could be something out of here. Uh, this is about the same level. Well, you can see on the other one, the office right. hat is just, it's in the same um, bug, just on the back side. So the since tank. the tanks are tied together, would one pressure thing work for both, or you'd have to go separate? It would be better if they're separate, okay. because okay. that way if you're doing your maintenance on one, or just something totally didn't work, if that was the only thing yeah, done, you can see it. Uh, these are cement line tanks, so we, we're not required to have an anode rod. It could be something that can be added, but it's not required right now, so there is not one right now. That's actually where that one inch port is on the top of the tank, is for the anode rod. Um, so if we are installing thermometers, then, then you know, it might be better to probably put in a port that's not that one, but it's, at this point it doesn't. Is it advantage of putting in the anode rod? Uh, yeah, just if there's any, um, what is it called? Um, not electrolysis, but if there's any type of like, um, I guess it could be kind of like an electrolysis. So what it would do is the anode rod is a sacrificial metal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the manufacturer doesn't require it on this. Like, it's, I don't know if I mentioned this is a cement line tank. It's not a glass line tank. If it was glass, it would have to be there. So it's not required. Um, it's optional. Uh, but they do want us to blow down the bottom of the tanks monthly. So what you do is um, just hook up a hose down into the drain and then slowly open the valves 30 seconds and then close it. Okay, you want to do that on each tank separately. Just so that there's any debris at the bottom of the tank. degree water, right? Uh, yeah, so you could mix that with, um, You can. what you do is get like domestic cold water. Let's see if we have a port around here. I don't believe there were any like hose of adapters in here. Potentially, it wouldn't be quite as effective, but you could use the, the 110. We don't have a hose bib in here. There wasn't any like hose or water connections. Which is so good. Yeah, there's a cold water connection. Yeah, so. <laughs> we could put one on there. Could you just could. Could you, you take it off that valve right there? Put that on there though. So you have to do a whole building shutdown. And this you work back. No. Still. Uh, no, no, so you might be able no, to no. freeze it. So, no, no. Could so you take it off that right over there where the, the stub up is? The stub yeah, up? There you go. There we go. Just take it right there. Half inch, half inch the hose adapter. Yeah, there we go. And you can run that over. That way you're tempering the water as you put it down the drain. So you're not putting the 140 down the drain. Okay. So that is something important that you do remember. Um, if you are draining down any of these high temperature systems over 120, make sure you're trying to dilute down that water. And, uh, it was a safety thing, right? I mean, it was a little, she could have maybe put a, a brass fitting on that or pop a 90 to blow down, otherwise the yeah, temperature, would... temperature on, get on that hose 
Yeah, it would definitely, if you're blowing down too, if you're using like a garden hose to blow something down yeah. like this over the 120, um, I would recommend cutting the end of it off. That way nobody can use it under pressure again. All right, but you still use it as a drain hose, but then it won't be under pressure. Yeah. I don't know the exact rating for a garden hose, but I can't see it's too much more than... It's more likely you'll put a 90 degree fitting on yeah. it and compress. Turn it down into the drain. Turn it down into the drain. If it don't be scalded. Yeah. Yeah, any, any uh, water system that's over 120, you start, the higher you go, the quicker you can get burnt. So just make sure you're being cognizant of doing that maintenance on any of the equipment. The tanks would probably be harder if you shut it down to try to let it get to atmosphere because they're insulated. But if you can shut down a, a, a piece of equipment like the day before you know you're doing the maintenance on it, that'd be a good thing to help it get down to like a more usable temperature. For sure. Yeah, I just saw that too. Uh, <laughs> it's like somebody's picked it up. Yeah, that's not even like. Yeah, you shouldn't have to. We'll make sure we look at that. Let's get it addressed. Um, we'll go over to building B quickly and just uh, review that real quick. Just so you see everything over there. Like I said, it's the same, but if you see something that you think is different, just please ask. You know, this is the time to get the information from me, okay? Let's walk over to B real quick. Hi guys, we're Cal Poly Pomona Student Housing, the new building. Um, in the construction phase, we called this building B. We're on the first floor in the McCamp room over here. We just wanted to briefly go over all the piping and the boilers over here. It's the exact same configuration. You got four of the same size units. Um, everything is just set up exactly the same over in this building over here. Four, heat, four boilers, two smart plate heat exchangers. Again, everything is ex exactly the same. The piping just might be in a different configuration, but we need to keep the heat exchangers on the same as building A. The pumps will operate the same as A. There's two storage tanks over here. Each one of those has an aquastat. Everything in building B is the same as in building A. Again, we have our, the condensate pumps that are pumping into the neutralizers over here as well. Were you guys able to see, here's the floats that we were talking about. So with a flashlight, you can shine it in the top and you can see there's a ball sitting down at the bottom. So that ball is not running through the condensate. That ball's floating in the top, there's a problem with the drain, okay? What's this one look like? This one's running, so it's just going to say both up on the top. But the ball's down there. Yep. Here's, so here's one right there. So you, you see it floating at the top. See how this ball yeah. sits down at the bottom? So that prevents the food gas from going out in the drain. And what's the heat pump? Um, it's a, uh, what do you call that? It's a, so it's a pH neutralizer, it's a, like a lime stone. Is it something we have to? Yeah, annually, we were saying annually, you're gonna wanna change those. We also wanna inspect it, so right now here, this pump's not tied into any alarm system, so it's gonna be a visual if it doesn't work. Eventually, it probably could be tied into like, you know, the VMS or something, if they have an extra input for an alarm. Um, but as of now, it's not required. You're looking for it. Definitely you, you just replace it. So you'll open the top and then you can dump the box the rocks out. So guys, make sure too when you are doing the maintenance on the pH tank, you would isolate, there's two boilers and two boilers, right? So make sure you're, uh, hope it's that like an off time that you can shut the boilers down that we're not actually trying to pump water into the tank, okay? Each set of two boilers has its own tank. So you can hopefully use the two boilers, you know, shut the two boilers down on the tank that you're working on, okay? So if people are running and we'll shut it off, Yeah. I mean, obviously, yeah, I would try to do the ones that aren't running first, get that one taken care of, and then even if it's one of the two, so you have to look at the drain piping, these two, kind of how they're set together. Those two tie into the same pump and pump into a tank, and then these two guys over here, uh, the drains tie together and, and go into a pump into a different tank. So we're shutting down at the... This is the switches right here, we find. Yeah, the switches right here, we find you're working outside the boiler. 
And if you're working on inside, anything on like the electrical on the inside, then you'd want to go okay. outside. And you're just shutting this down so nothing happens while you have that. So it's not out. firing and creating condensate mm -hmm. and running while you're trying to work on it. Anytime you're working on the piece of equipment, you want to shut it off. And where do you get that stuff? Common. You can order that through air treatment or uh, it's pretty much any like line. You just have to order like a line stuff. If you Google the part number, they're going to they're gonna sell like a replacement kit for it. So I know all the replacement parts for any of these units, for the Airco products, uh, you can purchase through air treatment. There's a rep for them. And that'll be turned over. Yeah, that'll be turned over in our O&M packet, like who our vendors were and all that. All that kind of contact information for getting replacement parts. Um, for even all the stuff I talked about yesterday is gonna be provided in that turnover kit. Um, who our vendor was and how to contact them for the, the replacement parts. So where are the disconnects in the transformers for these boys? So these are gonna be around the corner to the left over here. Same thing again, it's gonna go from 480 to 120. One switch that's two I don't know where the mechanical or electrical panel is for the rest of the over here. It's not in there like the other. Next door, the next door. I think it's kind of more like. Right, the other uh, side. Yeah, I think that's where it is. Well, yeah, you can see where the parts go through. Okay. You need to get it. So, um, with, so these these units are all calibrated right now. You know, I'll, I'll calibrate them all through from my startup and everything like that. As time goes on, you know, they get dirty and we'll get, get a little bit out of calibration and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, uh, to just show you how I go through my calibration is that there's different uh, percentages of the fire rate that I that I calibrate it to. So we go from 100 to 70 to 50 to 40 to 30 to 18 and that's where I, I set my limit is at 18 is the lowest it will go um, so in between there it's it's a little it's a little bit hard to calibrate so when you see that go up you may hear like um, combustion noises in between those in between those percentages uh, you may hear some whining or, or that's just that's normal it's not gonna blow up or anything like that. That's just a normal whine to it. And you know, we, we can try and refine that as much as possible, but uh, that's that's just part of the combustion. It's just gonna, you know, make a little bit of noise to it. If it gets really bad, that's that's something that really should happen. Or that, like that retuning that he's talking about would, would hopefully be addressed at the annual inspection. Right. So if we're having too much of that in between that, then we'd want to contact them to come out and try to figure out that calibration again. We noticed that during the startup phase that it kind of bounces off the buildings and you can amplify it, so, so it seems a little bit worse than here than it's normal. Boilers, again, the heat exchangers. Um, at the other building, I did forget to talk about the tanks. They are cement lined, like I mentioned. Uh, so once a year, you're going to want to open the manways. In the O&M book, there's a procedure on how to uh, open the manhole for the inspection of that and the cleaning process for a cement line tank. The most important thing too, like I said over the other building, is make sure you're blowing down the bottom of the tank so if there is any debris that's in the tank, we're blowing it out and it's not just keeping accumulating at the bottom of the tank, okay? So that'll be the biggest thing to help the maintenance for these tanks. Once a month for that? Yeah, once a month. That's what the manufacturer recommends. And if you're seeing you're getting a lot of stuff once a month, then we're going to need to do it twice a month. Okay? It's kind of an added, as needed as well. That's all I got on the tanks. We got cert pumps in just a couple minutes. We talked about the controls for these tanks to those cert pumps. The controls, any controls that are outside of Sunbelt's controls, um, that's all I know. Like I said, we do have the office tab we mentioned yesterday, right, up on top here for the building circulation pump controls. So this office tab runs down this conduit, down into the master pump. We have a master and a secondary. This pump tells this pump what to do, and only one runs at a time, okay? 
What's that after that set to? 120. Just and above 120. So, in my experience with these temp control valves, for like lead points, we need the opostat, but these temp controls, we want flow across them all the time. So if you start turning the pump off, if this hits a certain temperature, then we start having problems out there. So it's cheated up just a little bit above 120. For which part of it? There's a bunch cold of hose bits in here. Cold water, so we oh, cold water. We should okay. have the so same. The same. Uh, yeah, right there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, just remember, guys. Uh, we still have to get the batch flow certified. That's why this one's off. But downstream on this side of the batch flow is industrial water. Okay. And you got to be careful where you're taking water this way. Here's a port. But you can potentially drain the heating hot water loop by taking water from it. Okay? So we're trying to use it before the back. Not try, do. If you take it after, the odds are that you could be draining the heating hot water loop. Okay, so there's one port here and there's another port over down here. Okay? Those are not domestic water, it's all heating hot water. So that's your vent drain off of the strip pump from the tank. Okay, so if you check out here, there's a pump that's beyond it on both lines. One more okay. No, that's right, that's right. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was going to try to call it something else, but... <laughs> no, that's, 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 that's what it was, right? It was. That's a big deal. It got caught, though, right? These are 120 here. And Where, the where's here? Uh, these are the building cert pumps. Yeah, so these are pulling the water back down from the building. Yeah. So the 120 domestic hot water is cert pump. Heating is 370. 370. So we got to make sure, so we got Celsius at the bottom and top. This pump is probably not, this one's not running. We got like 105 and up here we got like 132 and this pump's running. So it's taking the colder water out of the tank, pushing it through the heat exchanger right now. So 120's here, 130 is the middle line and then 140. So what's the number on that? This is the speed of the pump. When we speed get in, pump. yeah, in like another half an hour, our pump guy will come out and he'll give you guys more information on the setup of the pumps. Okay? So the pump car's gonna be here at 10.30 or in 11? 11, 11.30. Okay. So we just come back? So that'd be a Oh, sorry. We have a three hour window right now. So I was gonna roll into VFDs. We got ABBs and a couple Danfoss on some air handlers. And then I'm hoping at that point he'll be here for a quick, I mean, the pumps are gonna take no time at all. I've already told you pretty much 90% of the pump information, okay? okay. okay. Um, and then we'll be done for the morning class, okay? So while Sean's here, any questions on the uh, heat exchangers? Again, the maintenance on these heat exchangers, the procedures looking at everything else are gonna be the same. Um, I don't remember if he mentioned this guy right here. This is an air vent. You want to make sure the cap is not tight. If the cap is tight, it won't work, okay? You're closing off the valve. Okay? If it's loose, it can vent air. It's more of a big deal if you're draining the unit and getting it started back up to vent that air out, okay? One on each heat exchanger. Good? You mentioned that. Yes. To, uh, Open the uh, the release, the pressure relief. Press relief once, whenever, uh, or every. Uh, I'd have to look at that sheet again. Unfortunately, I left that sheet over there. Um, I think that was in the monthly. I probably wouldn't. The manufacturer says do it monthly. Okay. Do you ever do this one? Um. Do you know anything about the release? Checking the release on these guys by chance? I mean, it's the same kind of valve. Would you say monthly or are these, is it quite as important to do that many that often? No, I wouldn't. We can reference back to the O&M for Airco Smart Plate on the actual duration they want their release to be. They're releasing the you. This one right here, uh, this side with the mixing box is the domestic. the domestic. Domestic side, yeah. 
The big control valve is gonna be your heating hot water side. So let's say uh, we did have to drain the hot the heating water system for repair. Hopefully okay. the valve will work or isolation valve will work. And you're saying in the building right now? Yeah. Okay. Um, what would, where would we do that? What would be the process? You're draining the whole building at this point? Yeah. Yeah, so this mechanical room will be the low point. So okay. anything at our level and below would work as a drain. So if it's above us, you can drain it at the center separator. Remember underneath this little opening is a valve. Okay. We want to make sure we blow these things down, um, I'd say every six months or so or a year. Six months or a year would be fine. But this is a low point if you're draining the entire building, right? Right. So obviously anything below it. This is a hose bib for the heating hot water loop. Potentially you can use this as a drain to drain the entire building, right? Okay. There's low points at the bottom of these boilers down here. There's a drain. There's a drain valve here. So if you had to drain the building and it's below the overhead piping above us, like pretty much, again, look at the labeling. Uh -huh. Make sure you're verifying you're draining the heating loop and not the chill loop. Uh -huh. Okay. And then any of these hose bibs that are down here will work as a drain for the entire building. And where, where would we shut off like the makeup water and... The makeup water yeah. heating hot water loop was right... Part of it's here, this is the pressure reducing valve station right here. Uh -huh. And if we follow that back, this back flow is another makeup for it. So this is a closed loop. The back flow, until it gets certified, was dripping a little bit, that's why it's off. Okay. That back flow will be normal, those valves will be normally open. And remember, all the way across this top pressure reducing valve station will be normally open. Does anyone remember what this valve right here is? Bypass? Yes, bypass. Is it open or closed? Closed. Okay, it always stays closed, or else you'll have the inlet pressure on your heating hot water loop. And remember, it's important because our expansion tank is set for our inlet pressure, our, our heating hot water system, okay? Which is 57 pounds, okay? So we have 56 here, one pound under our set point. Well, and 57 PSI gives us a positive pressure on top of the building, okay? You guys know how all that works? You lose. Um, 2.31 every you lose one psi every 2.31 feet okay so every time you go up 2.31 feet it's one psi lower as you keep going to the building so with this pressure set point we maintain a positive pressure on the roof and you always want to maintain a minimum of 12 psi at the top so if you have a pr pressure fluctuation you don't ever want to go to zero or negative at the top of your loop you'll start getting air okay you'll lose circulation so that's why we have the set point that we do. We'll have a positive pressure up on the roof. I think it's like roughly 30 PSI or so. We just want to be above 12. But we don't need it to be 100 up there because down here it's going to be like even higher, right? Then you have to do all that math to add it back up, okay? So this is a safe pressure to have down here and have enough uh, positive pressure up at the top of the building. What's the bypass for? Just Fast filling. So like your partner said, he drained this whole building. Well, if you use this reg to try to refill that system, it's going to take forever. So you have to be here when you're refilling the system and you're watching the system pressure as you fill it up. Right. If you overshoot it a little bit, it's not the end of the world. Just make sure you bleed it back down and you close the bypass valve and then watch the inlet pressure. Make sure we stay at our design pressure. Okay. And the design pressure is again? I got 57 PSI. 57 PSI. And then the expansion tank, it's important, matches that. So we have auto bleeders up high and there's manual the vents at the top. Manual vents? Yes. Where are those at? On every fan coil. We have fan coil training tomorrow. So we'd have to go open all those other. You'd have to go through every unit at the top of the eighth floor and blow down every vertical riser. Because remember all the piping is on the first floor and it goes out like this guy right here. So we got the mains. We got our branch lines right here, and then this will be your vertical riser all the way up. So we got heating, heating, chill, chill, condensate. Okay, condensate's the last pipe. So the condensate drains are a vertical riser all the way down too. Okay, so you share a riser. So if the unit on the second floor, the condensate starts backing up out of that, it's probably the drain from there down that's plugged up, not allowing it to drain. But just know that the units above it, unless they get shut off, are going to keep making condensate. Okay. Yep. So if you have a condensate issue on the second floor, you make sure that you go to the BMS system and temporarily like keep those valves closed so you get that drain worked out. Obviously, you have to probably notify the tenants. Hey, we have a we have to do a maintenance thing, and make sure that they know that they won't have.
on the guitar part. So on those manual valves on the eighth floor, can you replace those with the automatic valves? Is there no space up there? Yeah, there's, you're pretty much using the strainer for the hose. The strainer on the fan coil, you're using as the vent. And then there's a little tiny air vent at the top of the coil. So what we did at startup when we were filling and flushing the system, we took, um, we either had Georgia, you know, a Georgia buggy, those big construction wheelbarrows, something yeah. like that. But we just got like a whole bunch of hoses and ran the hoses from the drains. First we did supply, we blew down the supply until all the air was, until the hose stopped jiggling. Because if the hose is jiggling, that's air coming through the hose. We do the supply all the way out, then we close the supply shutoff valve. I can show you guys this tomorrow. Then we open the return, open the actuator, and then open that strainer again. And then you're blowing all the air out of the coil through the, the strainer drain and through the return piping. Hopefully you don't have to do that very often. Not in our experience, we have to do it more than we want to. Just know that, yeah, it, it'll be a good idea to go to every top of the room so obviously that would be something at the end of the semester when the kids aren't in the rooms anymore, then you could get back up to the top and bleed those, those units out. If you don't, those top units might lose a little bit of capacity for heating and cooling because the top of the air might, or the top of the coil might be full of air. Just make sure you do get in there and bleed that out so it's fully full. Okay? okay? Makeup water, we know where the makeup water is. We don't have makeup water for chilled water, it's all for campus food. So if you had a major shutdown in the building on chilled water, I would notify the plant guys, hey, we had to shut all this down, we had to drain it, we got to refill, because they might be able to see when you open the valves back up and fill, their level might drop. Just give them a heads up, you know? Give them a heads up that you're refilling the building if there's an issue on the chilled water side, because it'll be coming from the TES tank or the storage tank. Good on that? Good. Cool. Thank you guys want to take a couple minute break and then I can talk about VFDs? Okay. Is that cool? Do you want like 10, 5? Ready? Alright guys, um, we took a little break real quick. We're uh, back. We're in Building B Mechanical Room. Uh, we're going to talk about the drives for the pumps in Building B. And then we're going to mosey on over to build, back to Building A and talk about the air handler VFDs. So we have two different style uh, VFDs out here. We have ABB, which is an ACH 550 drive, and then we have Danfoss drives, okay? Uh, we're gonna talk about the ABB ones now in building B. We have the same drives on the pumps on building A too for the heating hot water pumps and the chilled water pumps. So Sean is gonna review the ABB drives on our heating hot water pumps over here. Just like you said, this is an ACH 550. It's a um, HVAC series drive. Um, we have here the, the drive and the Eclipse setup. So we have this in the uh, Nemo 1 torpedo style configuration. Um, the more condensed, and you know, they also have the outdoor cabinet and all that sort of thing. Um, you, you know, you may see them. Um, a different configuration but you have your drive and then your bypass eclipse bypass here so coming into it you have all, all your control signals all your start stop communication all that sort of thing is going to be landed on the eclipse right here and that's going to be communicating everything to the vfd through its own internal mod bus so all the, uh, any kind of like communication stuff you see with this, it's communicating to this. So um, the only thing that's going to the drive is the analog signal um, that will give it your speed reference. Um, so if you're, if you're looking at whether it has, you know, um, the most common thing I get calls for is safety interlock fault which will be uh, you know, 1608 safety interlock and that'll be shown on both of them and that's what that is is there's a there's a hardwire set that will shut down the whole thing if there's a uh, 
uh, external fault to it. So a lot of times you'll see that uh, fire shut down. I don't know if there's anything on this one. Yeah, not but pumps. Yeah, but uh, that's one of the most common things I'll see on this. So we look at the top, we see what it's doing. Um, we can look at the top, top left and we see that it's in auto. So that it's running off of, it's all automation. It's gonna start and stop when it wants. It's gonna take any kind of control reference. And that reference, what it wants is right here, 47.6 hertz, that's what it wants to be at. Um, the top line here is what it actually is at, 47.5, so it's right on schedule. Um, you'll see those, when you have slow ramp times or something like that, those won't always be the same. You know, so you say you got 120 second ramp cycle, it'll say 47.5, but it might be at 20 hertz. It'll take a while to get up there. So that's what it's actually doing. Um, the 56 point, or 5.6 amps is an average of the, of the, the three, what so average is about. Um, and then 14, 12 RPM. And that's, so these are all programmable. You can put them to what you want. And that's what they they pick that they want is when I see the art pans right there. You can, these are changeable. You can see what you want, but um, that's what's been chosen. Um, you have hand, uh, which so I could put it in hand and I can go up and down with that with that hertz. I can go all the way up to 60, whatever the limit is set to. Typically it's 60, um, or I can go down. You don't want to go lower than 20 on a pump. 20 on pumps, 15 on fans. Um, you don't want that motor spinning too slowly that you're starting to cook the windings. Uh, the, the, the motor itself is designed to have air moving over it to keep those windings cool. So if you're going too slow, you're just gonna sit there and cook the pump. So we set our limit to uh, 20 on pumps and 15 on fans so that um, you get that start signal. It's gonna start off at 20 and then it's gonna see that reference and it's gonna start to come up from there. Um, like I said, so everything else is coming through the bypass, um, which you shouldn't need to do too much with the bypass, but I can, I can see what's... The only thing we had programmed down there was the Modbus communications. Right, so They're you got only, Modbus only communications only. coming in, you guys shouldn't have to mess with that. Definitely don't mess with the communications up here, because, um, you go through change parameters, you can see that it's set up for Modbus, which they're talking to each other Modbus. That has nothing to do with the building. Uh, the macro is eclipsed, so that's talking to this. If you change any of those, it's gonna throw the whole thing off and you gotta reset the whole thing, which is kind of a pain. Um, but while we're in the change parameters, you can see the motor data is set up. Uh, speed, all that. There's your minimum 20, like I was saying earlier. Constant speed, that, that is actually nothing. There, we're not actually using that. Um, stop function is ramp, so it'll ramp to a stop. Uh, we're keeping it on ramp because of the check valves we have. They're gravity style check valves, so we want the pumps to slow down slowly and not just turn off and smash the disc down on the check valve, okay? So there is a reason why the program ramp. There's some kind of documentation with all your guys with the digital settings. I have all the change parameters on my starter machine. Okay. Okay. That'll be turned over in the journal. The journal will happen for you guys. Okay. And the rest of this is just the display settings, like I said, was changeable. And you have a parameter backup, which he's he's he saved everything up to the keypad here. Um, so that, that has a backup in case something happens. Um, you have, it's, up, it's already been uploaded to the panel. And you can go to download full set if it's the exact same motor, or you could go download application if it's a different motor, and then you've got to manually enter all the, the motor data to it. Um, so, pretty much that's it. Uh, hand auto uh, bypass. Don't use the bypass in, on a pump. This, you'll overpressurize. Uh, you'll you're gonna go straight to full speed, you're gonna go around the drive, but we, yeah. Do you guys, when, we, when he says Eclipse bypass, the Eclipse part is just ABV's fancy Trade control part. logic. Yeah, the bypass means you're running the pump at full speed, 60 hertz. Yeah. 
So if we run a bypass out here in the middle of the summer when we don't need heat and all the control valves are shut, it could potentially start trying to push those valves open and fail valves. It's running the pump at full speed. It's like 300 and something GPM. So we don't want to run the bypass, okay? It's there as like an emergency, emergency feature. Right now we have redundant pumps. So if one VFD or one pump fails, you should be able to transfer to the other pump. If for some really crazy reason you lost both pumps and you had to use the bypass, what I would recommend is going to the front end or manually going up to our bypass loop and opening that bypass valve on this loop right here and opening the heat exchangers, those three-way valves all the way. Because remember, that pump's running at full speed, 300 something GPM. We need somewhere for that water to go. That way, this specific site on the heating loop only right now has something like that, okay? Where you can, you would be able to limp by, right? And create a flow condition that would allow the pump to manage to run in bypass mode, okay? That would be, like worst case, worst case scenario, you lost both drives, really. If you lost both drives, that's the only time then you would still be able to operate a bypass, one of the bypasses. If you lost a pump motor or a pump balloon, it's different there, okay? You're not gonna be able to run the pump at all, okay? So just, and then obviously once that condition's fixed and the drives are operable and you can run the, the pump at, at varying speeds, you're gonna need to close everything you open, okay? On these actuators, there is a black clutch button on top. So you can press that button and you stroke the handle that we can see that's turned here. So you push the black, black button that's up on top of this orange top right here. You'll stroke this open and then on the side, there's a little clip. So as the valve is open, you press that clip and it'll lock it open. To release it, you just push down on the top of the button again. Do you want to see it? We can grab the ladder. Are you guys good? Have you seen the Belimos? It's a, st a standard Belimo valve. It's nothing special. Okay. That's what I, that's my two cents on the bypass in this application. For here, the chilled water, we don't have all that fancy stuff. Okay. We don't have all these fancy loops. So on the chilled water side, I'm going to say, unless it's an absolute emergency, do not use the bypass. It, none of these drives are programmed to auto switch the bypass. The only way you'll be able to initiate bypass is pressing buttons on the keypad and we'll show, we'll show you what buttons need to be pushed, but please don't do that, okay? Yeah. Just keep it in the off mode. If, uh, if you need to run it, uh, use hand. You can keep it, keep it low and safe and you can keep things. So the hand feature he's talking about now is through the drive. You're in yeah. hand mode and using the up and down arrows, you can control the speed of the motor. Yeah. That's better, but if you leave it at too high of a speed again, we can run into the same situation. Right. Okay. Yep. Um, all right. I'll say, from personal experience, one of the most common things I, one of the most common failures I see, is this little fan right here. Um, well, over, you know, a few years or whatever, they start to break down and you lose the fan. And what happens with that is, it sucks up the, that control voltage. That's also the same as the keypad, so you'll you'll see a blank keypad. Yeah, I mean you could try switching them. While they're in auto, you can pull the keypads out and not affect the drive. You're not gonna get any kind of fault on that. So you can pull them out while they're running in auto. In hand, you're gonna get a fault. Um, but that um, that fan will you'll lose that and, um, and you won't be able to run the drive so, until you get a replacement. And then talking to the fan that's probably the only maintenance thing you really got to do on this is is i recommend every so often is pulling out the fan and you can blow through the heat sink just maybe take some dry nitrogen and blow the thing out make sure it doesn't get too dusty and all that keep it clean um just real quick on that obviously we're talking about electricity right now yeah make sure you depower the unit these are vfds so they have capacitors in them they store electricity you, when you turn off power, you need to let it dissipate the capacitors. They say five minutes. Right. Um, if you're doing what Sean's saying now and you're cleaning out heat sinks, turning off the disconnect and locking and tagging out, that disconnect right there is not adequate enough. Right. If you're trying to blow nitrogen through the unit, you still have live voltage down at the bottom of the unit. So if you're doing that part of the unit, if you're doing that type of maintenance, you need to make sure you go back to the main electrical panel, lock and tag out that, and then verify there's no voltage here before you start blowing the nitrogen. 
You can blow the nitrogen in it, but if that then blows dust and shorts phase to phase, you're gonna have an issue, okay? So if you're doing that style of maintenance, make sure it's locked out, tagged out, follow all the proper procedures that Cal Poly has for you guys out there to work on electricity, okay? And verifying electricity is there or not there. Um, any other faults that you can, uh, you'll have in a fault log here, anything that's past occurred, you can see what this is just from startup, but that's why I like to, you saw me earlier, making sure that the clock was programmed, that I, the, the clock keeps the accurate fault information, and you can go through and see that, uh, um, that if your fault information is stored properly, and you can go through. I think for the clock, there's like a, uh, there's a battery in the keypad. I think it lasts like roughly five years. It was like five Something years like so. that. I've never, I've never had a problem with it. Like <laughs> a AAA or? No, it's like one of those little disc style batteries. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, watch, watch, watch battery. Yeah. Yeah. Watch battery. I don't know which one. But. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think that's right for the drive. Yeah. So on the drive, you can see there's buttons. Um, when we're saying drive and bypass, Right here, we want to make sure the green light is always on on the drive side. Drive is always on the left. We don't want this light over on the right to be lit up green. Okay, that means you're in bypass mode. Again, we talked about the bypass. It's like way last case scenario. I mean, you're in the middle of the winter, right? And you still need it. I guess even it could be summer though, technically, right? Because these are our heat, our domestic hot water these pumps run the pumps that are making our domestic hot water. So the hot water system, I mean, again, you wanna to try to make sure you're, you're, if you're switching, we have redundant pumps is what I'm trying to say that if we have an issue, we wanna fix it right away. But if, if something happened and you lost both, there is that option on the hot water side. And that would be more critical than the chilled water. Chilled water is important too for the IDF rooms and electric rooms. Just make sure we have a green light on the left for drive and make sure the green light up here is on too. If you have a red light on either one, it's showing you there's a fault either in the bypass or in the main VFD. What's the green light on the bottom one, that one, the other one is on? Uh, that one's the one that's actually running. Okay. And then when you're doing that annual maintenance on blowing out the unit, if it's dusty, mostly the, the blowing out of nitrogen is, a, is an add need, as needed. If it's not dusty in there and it's not dirty, don't do it, right? If you see it there, then do it. Um, anytime you blow that, anytime you're blowing it around, you can shift that dust somewhere else that you might not be able to see. So it's as needed, okay? Um, when you're doing that, annual two you want to make sure you go through and uh, disconnect that power again make sure the the units um, all the way off lock and tag out the main breaker to electric room and we want to check all the lugs all the electrical lugs okay as things heat up and cool down they expand and contract and it could change the tension on all the lugs and if you have a loose connection that can create problems on the drive miscellaneous weird errors and alarms so once a year we want to go through the drives and uh, check all the screws You'll see when you when you shut it off, it'll take a while for the drive to actually power down and shut off. That's because those capacitors store so much. Power. The chilled water valves, are, the chilled water VFDs are the same as the hot, same ACH 550 drive. I think it's even the same horsepower. Even um, all the motors here are the same um, in buildings A and B for the heating and chilled water pumps. Um, on the ABB system. The control guys are just grabbing data from the drives. They're not using COM to turn them on or off, but there is COM, um, the units are programmed for communication. I believe that was Modbus. So, so basically the control system is really just information. The controls are changing the speed of the drive okay. and okay. turning on and off the pump, staging the pumps uh, for run hours. But other than that, the communication data in the drive is just being pulled for reference. But they are using a, it's a zero to 10 volt speed signal. And that is off of a differential pressure transducer that's up on the eighth floor. With all the valves open, 
with all the valves for one pump flow, that differential pressure was red, and that's their set point. So as valves start closing, the differential pressure goes up, the pump starts slowing down. As valves open, the DP goes down, the pump speeds up. And that's done through the zero to 10 volt signal. This is the parameter I use for a quick check to see just from my side. Some, you know, sometimes it's accurate, sometimes not, but I can tell that they're online, so they're talking to the building automation. See, so you'll see online, offline, standby. That's kind of a, a quick check. Not always 100% oh, accurate, but. Are you guys familiar with ABP drives? As far as faults and stuff like that, they're all pretty much on a CD now. You know, you got to have a CD book or a CD and a computer. Um, I haven't seen a book and I couldn't tell you how many years. Um, the Eclipse Bypass will have that, but we'll, in our documentation, the turnover, it'll be an electronic version of the ONM that has the fault codes and uh, troubleshooting and all that kind of stuff in there. And then the parameters and what each parameter does. Like he said, you really shouldn't need to change any parameters now. We have these um, pumps dialed in right now. The only thing like Sean was saying is if, since we have uploaded the information in the keypad, if you do lose a drive, you just order the same drive, the model and serial number, or the model and serial is on the side of the unit over here. Side or on the front? Yeah. Right. This tag right here, this tag right here. You can order another drive. Uh, air treatment is the rep for them, so you can contact them. They can get you the replacement drive. And what you do is you pop that keypad out, you uh, replace the drive after you've done your lockout tag out, right? Everything's turned turned off and safe to work on. You replace the drive, make sure you tag your old keypad so you know which one's which. Because uh, if you grab the new one and stick it in, it won't have the parameters. But the cool thing that Sean was saying is you put that old keypad on and you download the set, all that information in the drive that was in the keypad is going to be in that new drive. You will re need to reprogram the uh, communication down into the bypass, okay? So to be able to see the Modbus points coming back in, actually, no, the, the excuse me, you, you yeah. You take the drive off if you want to that's, that's true, that's true. So the keypad is what holds the information and all your old set points and stuff. Not typically, the, not typically, unless you upload it to it. Yeah. Okay. But, but it can also have a memory to it, so. No, if, if you if you take if you take a blank keypad out of the box and plug it in, and you're looking at change parameters, you're looking at all that stored in the drive. But until you upload it to the keypad, then they both have it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you it doesn't have to upload it to the keypad, then plug it into the new drive. Yeah. So in our startup, what we do is it comes blank, or more or less blank. There's a few factory change parameters. We enter the motor horsepower, the motor RPM, the motor amps, and we start changing ramp speeds depending how the system's working. And once we're like, oh my gosh, this is working good. And then we go back and we go upload the keypad. So that way all those little tweaks and all that fine tuning we did is stored in the keypad. So if that drive ever stops working, we put the new drive in, you can download all that because you already know it worked. It's just for whatever reason, the drive stopped working. Then you have all those little tweaks that you can download into the new drive. So at this point, right now they're uploaded into the keypad. That's so correct. if that drive goes bad, we can take that keypad, plug it into the new drive, and upload it into the, the new drive. Yep. And then we go Download back, it. Download it. Don't upload it. And then, then you'll wipe out that keypad. Yeah. And then go in, and then do we put the new keypad on, in Just there? Just leave it how it is. Leave, leave the new keypad somewhere in here as like if the keypad stops working, that could be your blank, right? But what I'm saying is, okay, so the keypad stops working and we need to replace the keypad. Now can we upload the new parameter into a new keypad? Uh -huh. from the, so then, from the then yeah, then you would upload into the new keypad. So if you took the old keypad, you download it into the drive. If you took that old keypad off, put the new keypad on. Remember, the parameters are saved in the drive. Okay. Then you want to re-upload the parameters into that keypad. Okay. Then you would have two. Just make oh, sure when okay. you bring that keypad, you know where you're putting, you know, make sure you write down like, like whatever it was. Yeah, whatever it was. So yeah, you could use that. Ultimate, that's the ultimate uh, fail safe, just write everything down. Yeah, just label it. Because you could take that keypad and download over to here in this specific application because any communicate, the, the drives are the same size and the motors are the same size. And any COM programming is done down here. 
Does that make sense? Is yeah. that too much? No, no, I got it. Okay. Good on that one? Yep. We saw the chilled water pumps are back here, okay? Mm -hmm. In this building, building B. Building B, first floor mechanical room. There's only four ABB drives in each building. <coughs> for building A and for building B. We do have one Danfoss drive over here on Air Handler 3. I'm hoping we can get to that tomorrow, but they started sealing the floor in the main lobby in building B. The same, similar air handlers, different sizes are in building A, okay? So we're gonna use those two as our reference. Any other questions on the ABB stuff before we go over and deal with Dan Foss? Okay? Cool. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. See, we have a 10 footer over there. He likes to know. He can always watch a video too, right? Yeah. Cool. All right, guys. Mike again, Cal Poly Pomona. We're in the student housing buildings. We're in our building called Building B. Uh, it's easier for us to show you guys the pumps over here. Uh, the same for configuration is in building A, just in different locations. Um, we're on the first floor in the mechanical room. I have Troy here with DB Sales. He's uh, the vendor and the factory rep for the Velo cert pumps. We've already spoke about them. Now we're going to talk about the interface directly on the pump. All right. Hello. So the good thing about these pumps, they're maintenance free. They're self-lubricating by the system fluids, so it's really nice. You don't have to really worry about a whole lot. Uh, but these two are set up master slave. Uh, top one's the master, bottom one's the slave. Uh, on the bottom one, the spinny wheel does absolutely nothing since it's a slave. It doesn't do anything. Uh, the top one we have it set at 27.9 RPMs right now. Uh, that's 2,700 RPMs. Uh, both of them are running off the Aquasat, which I believe is set at 120. 120. Yeah, 120. So if it's below 120, pumps are running, goes over 120, pumps shut down. We've got our isolation shutoffs here, power disconnects. Uh, looks like this one's for the top, this one's for the bottom. Um, and if you do need to adjust speed on these, all you gotta do is just Turn the dial either way, and once you get to a desired speed, you click the button in. Uh, and if uh, these are set up to alternate every 24 hours of runtime, so only one pump will be on at a time. And the way you can tell which one is on, uh, there's kind of like this little bar right in the middle. I don't know if you want to kind of zoom in and check this out. So right here, see how it's got like a little black bar right there in the middle? This one okay. basically, so that one's off. This one's running. So what is that supposed to be? It's just their indicator of <laughs> which one's on my eight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the online. <laughs> so this this like little bar right here. Square. And then this one doesn't have it since it's offline. Yeah. And so I can show you this if you want to look. So we're at 27.9. Say I want to go 30. Just spin it. Starts blinking. Click it, and it sets. What's the supposed to be set at? This was set at 27.9. Uh, so 2700 RPMs. We're looking for the speed, the lowest speed to save energy that we're circulating water throughout the entire building. When all those temperature valves are closed. Because all those things should be at temperature and they should should be most of the way closed, flowing the least amount of water. So why would we come here and adjust the speed on it? You shouldn't need to. Right. You shouldn't need to. If you're not getting the flow, maybe the strainer in the pump is getting dirty, or we talked about the temperatures, maybe something, some debris got stuck in those, creating a problem. Um, but we shouldn't need to adjust the speed on the pump. 
and if you do ever have any issues with them, uh, one of the pumps will come up with an E code, an error code, um, and just check in the manual to find the description and possible fixes. If not, um, you can always try cycling power on and off. Sometimes that works, but obviously if the issue keeps coming up, you'll need to contact us or uh, uh, verify the technician to come get it fixed. Yeah, so the aqua stats up here on the common line runs down and we'll These units have the IF modules, right? Right. Do you want to tell them where it tie, where the Aquastat ties into, and then uh, the lower one needs to keep the jumper, right? Right. Well, yeah. I mean, there's there's an IF module in here, um, which receives a signal from the Aquastat. Uh, we got cable connecting in both. It just plugs right in to the unit. So potentially that module. One of these modules go bad, we can order a module and do we need to do any programming on that? How do we do to replace that in this system? More than likely, I think some, oh, if it's on the master, then yeah, I think some programming is going to be required. But I believe on the slave, it should be all right. Okay. So can we do that programming or is that something that needs to be programmed? You, you could attempt it. There is uh, some descriptions in the manual. It's a little hard to read, but if you can get through that, yeah, it, it's, it's doable. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you can hand me the little black box on the cardboard box. <coughs> it's on the back there for me. Oh, is it? Well, the IF module looks exactly like this. It's got just a couple wires going in here. This connects, goes in, connects. that module separately without replacing right. the cool. whole piece. Right. And that module will come off and you can replace the pump by itself or okay. yeah. the pump balloon or the pump like the motor in the, the pump itself motor. is like more or less all one unit. Right, right. that's what it, uh, the impeller can be replaced I believe right? right yeah you can pull these there's a few uh four allens here pull the well, but also the time what we do is if you know it's the whole motor assembly with the with the impeller and everything we'll change that whole yeah. thing. I, I assume that's you guys sell that piece separately if we need to just change that motor, if that motor's not starting or whatever have you. Probably just buy the whole thing. Yeah. You know, the, blue, the, the cost of that blue is probably not the much. Yeah, not. it probably comes with it, but it's easier for us oh, to yeah, just throw, sure. it, throw yeah. it on there, you know, get the blue still could, in good shape, yeah. you know. Is, we have that issue with one of these ones here. And that's how I replace it. Yeah. I think it was this one, right? So yeah, the pro the, those pumps are programmed in like the speed control mode. There's different programming modes. We're not using those. Um, it's just easy. It's easy enough to use speed control, where you you're changing the RPM of the pump. We're not ramping the pump up or down. It's just a constant speed that we're setting it at, and it would turn on and off with uh, the Aquastat. But again, with the type of valves we have up on the floor, we really want circulation. To keep that flow through those devices, so it's constantly shifting. Yeah, I assume water. you've set that high enough where it's basically one of those is running all the time, right? That's what it sounds like to me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it can be that can be set up when we're done. We're not done commissioning yet. Does that make sense? Yeah. And if you do ever have to shut these down, we got isolation valves here. Got one here for the bottom pump, another one right back here for the top pump. Just make sure power shut down before you isolate. Because pumps to deadhead and ruin the pumps if they're running with no flow. Any questions? Again, these are the building research pumps. Right back, oops, sorry. right back here on the wall, we have our tank research pumps. Those tank research pumps are configured the exact same way. Um, 
We're just running them at full speed because we want full circulation through the tanks and the heat exchangers, okay? Um, that's what I got on that. There, those pumps have the IF modules too. On those pumps over there, the it's like an EXT is the start stop feature of those. So since there's two aquastats over there, each pump has its own port, you know, its own aquastat into that EXT setting. Where over here we only have it on one, and the second pump, the slave pump, has the factory installed jumper. If you take that jumper out, that pump will never run. Okay, so that that jumper needs to stay in. That's the only difference between these two systems right here. That these are twinned and that needs the jumper and those are uh, standalone. Each pump will run individually depending upon the office staff. These serve pumps, that's all we got for the interface. It's pretty simple right now set up. The air codes, we gotta visit the O&M manual and it'll give you those air codes. Uh, for any of the maintenance parts, DB sales, again, that information will be in our turnover packet. They're our vendor that we bought it from, so they'll have replacement parts. You guys can go through them. Um, they're also service, they're obviously the factory service uh, for VLO. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, so you guys do actual service? If you did, yeah, but a lot of times. Yeah, this, these yeah, things kind of your sense. application over here wouldn't be as much. On yeah. building D, they have the water heaters and the boilers, so. Yeah. Exactly. We're not going to talk about later. That later discussion. Care of it. <laughs> Good guys. The, uh, yes. Any other questions on anything? It doesn't have, it have to be other than Troy's uh, the pumps. pumps for these tanks. So you say they, you know, there's one sensor for each one, but are they tied into each separate tank separately, or yes. are they piped so separately? So here's the location. Or? We follow the conduit back, and it goes. This right tank should be the right pump. Okay. The left tank should be the top pump. So this yeah, I'm just wondering how they integrate because they're they're all in the same line once they get over to over to that. So they the piping is equal distance. Look at uh, over here. Okay. We have the piping equal distance to each oh, tank. Okay. So right. one it can pull out of both tanks together. Okay. And then it can push into both tanks. So they're, so they're in the same, they have the same line going to them, but each one works off of, yeah. Okay. It's not the end of the world. Eventually that one pump will, they'll catch up. And yeah. the, the theory is that if whatever tank needs to run, we needed two in case you shut down one. Yeah. That way you can still draw the water out. Again, for the aquastats, as long as you're only isolating one tank, if you drain that tank and that aquastat tells the pump on to run, as long as the other tank is there, and, oh, and the valves are open, it'll just constantly run water through that tank, which all you're doing is wasting energy at that point. But then you always know that that tank is charged with the right amount of water. When I say wasting energy, it's like 0.3 amps. Yeah, right. Yeah, because the BMP over there is on this pump, so. They just don't draw a lot. Excuse me? I was just wondering, so, yeah, it sounds like when, say, this Sorry, one is me? calling for, for a pump to run over there, it really it'll, should be pulling water, water, out, of water out of both tanks. Even though it, this one's only calling for it, it'll be basically feeding both tanks. Yep. At the so same time. Ideally, both tanks should be the same temperature at all times. Exactly. Right? Yep. Okay. Yeah, we have a we have a system over in our suites where the tanks are not not a pipe correctly, where uh, one will be outputting cold water while the other one. Now you could have potentially that happen here if somebody shuts one valve, right? Right, yeah. yeah. So all the valves yeah, have like to be open someone, no shuts, someone shuts off the Or probably the one of the lower right valves. There, if you shut off the output, you won't be outputting the cold bar off the top of the tank. But if you if you shut off one of the lower valves here, and it's not I mean you're gonna you have the equalizer, but I mean the heat would have to transfer through the water and all that, but it, it would definitely be lower. That's why it's important you're looking at the output thermometer. We do have an inlet thermometer on some of these. On your guys' buildings both have inlets of the heat exchangers, so you can see the actual, you're like, well man, this isn't going up. Yeah. Well, is it because of this, or is it because of this? So you have a gauge yeah, here that you know. Just know that if it is low, this if you're not actually, right here, yes, right? if you're not actually yeah. flowing the water through here, it's gonna read a little bit. Right? It should be 140 all the time, right? 
should be close to one forty. Okay, cool. Do you have any other trainings for us today? Not or for that's today. It? Okay. We're just about there. I guess we'll see you tomorrow then, right? Tomorrow, air handlers, fan coils. What else was it? Air handlers, fan coils. We'll have to do exhaust scans. I didn't sleep up here again. It's going to be this valve right here. This is a normally closed valve, okay? We use it for flushing. Um, but in, in the design of right now, it's not to be, it's just, it's a normally closed valve. Oh, never. It depends. Okay, again, if you if you had a situation where you need to create a primary, secondary, where the 41 degrees ended up not being a good temperature and you try to bring it up, but it's just, it was here for flushing and needs to stay closed. That's yeah. the most important thing that we know for right now. Because if this thing starts cracking open, you're probably gonna start seeing like 50 degree, 55 degree water, you're gonna get warmer water in the building than what you want, especially if a pump is running. Any other questions? No. A lot of stuff. Tomorrow. A lot of stuff. More factory training for tomorrow.